Hey everybody, welcome back to the Combat Chain. We have a huge episode for you this week. It is our first double header. We have two two guests today. Uh, the first is uh, the host of the Fresh and Buds podcast. He is basically my best friend at this point. Uh, we love him very much here at the Combat Chain. Tommy Fresh is here with us today. Tommy, how are you doing today? I'm good. I'm good. Now, it's it's interesting. I, I know who the next guest is, and obviously he's of, of great acclaim, and he's the best. And I actually, I, I, I love him as well. Uh, we, we booked me before us nats assuming i was going to win us nats and then uh that didn't happen and <laughs> i don't think we yeah. assumed that but <laughs> right. we assumed we one of us might, would win might be one of us we just <laughs> thought we'd narrow it down just make it easy on ourselves in case we either of us won unfortunately that did not happen but before we get to the the second guest i also want to introduce uh my co-host adam philip check the tall drink water with the orange cap how are we doing today sir Doing good, Pat. Uh, it's good to be here. Hey, Tommy, how's it going? It's going good. I, I miss you. We missed you this weekend. Yeah, unfortunately, I, I guess Fort- U.S. people only, except for Isaac Crut and some other folks. <laughs> it, you know what? Can if I could have swung it, I would have made it down for the calling this weekend. But uh, I actually had a wedding I had to attend, so that took priority. Um, yeah. Yeah, it happens, fair. right? Family happens. Life. Uh, yeah, so yeah, outside the Nationals, the Canadians came. I thought I thought the Canadians were still arresting, but it turns out a whole handful of them came down to spike the call. Canadians in Charlotte. never rest. They don't. We stay they hungry. Killers. Uh, Isaac Crute, Joel Repton, and a, and a few others came down. Yeah, Matthew Isaac Dilks, Crute. I heard as well. Yes, yeah. yep. Yep, Matthew Dilks and, uh, and a couple others whose names escaped me, but I know there was... There was a lot of them uh, in there, but uh, Isaac ended up getting second in the calling. No coverage for the calling this weekend, which I thought was odd. So I don't know if that's a Star City thing or a Flesh and Blood thing, but the the calling was actually uh, completed. Right, the hall closed at six Sunday evening, and they still they they did. I believe they did the battle hardened and. The calling final upstairs outside the hall in like a quiet conference room. So there was like Star City photographers that took the picture, but there there was no calling coverage that weekend. I thought that was that was a little odd. <clears throat> it was a very good uh, good competition. I was I was keeping keeping tabs uh, the whole time on it, but uh, odd that it wasn't wasn't covered. But Isaac Isaac Crute did get second from that Canadian traveling uh, brigade here. Before I get too far ahead of myself, our second guest today is the U.S. national champion, one on Sunday evening, the innovator of Icelander himself, Michael Hamilton, will be on later in the pod. And really looking forward to just picking his brain about how the hell he came up with the deck that he did. Uh, So looking forward to that. That's later in the pod. But uh, right now, it's about us. We wanted to just get get together with with our friends and kind of just rest a moment here and think about the last couple weeks. We haven't had, I feel like we haven't had a time, uh, like a real chance to kind of decompress a little bit. So just wanted to, uh, first, let's just check in. Adam, how, how are you? I know you had the wedding over the weekend. We haven't really gotten a real good chance to talk about your experience at Nationals. And I want to talk about our experience at Nationals too, but I'm not going to leave you hanging here. So <laughs> I, w- <laughs> I want to know, uh, we, don't have to go, we're, we don't have to go round by round with everybody, but, but your, your, your Canadian Nationals experience, you ended 11th uh, at Nationals, which is, is nothing to shake a stick at. We had Tarek on last week talking about how difficult the time it is to to achieve uh, some victories in that canadian nets likening it more to a pro tour and the u.s nets more to like a calling experience um but tell us tell us a little bit about about your canadian nationals uh, experience mr 11th place yeah um 
11th out of odd, uh, roughly 100 odd players. Our player cap was 128, but not a whole, not all uh, 128 invitees showed up, unfortunately. Uh, but yeah, um, let's see. We so we played Viscerai, uh for the CC rounds. Uh, a little brew that uh, myself and Nathan Fortin had been working on, and um, we. we to not get we're not going to dissect it round by round but yeah so the the first few cc rounds uh we started off uh 2-1 in cc uh got um the one round we lost uh played against alexi that um kept us on our toes uh started off the first few tunes very like just just fusing with lightning cards and and very aggressive very go wide and so i'm like okay this this thing is going to be like 100 percent a race and then a couple round or a couple turns in ends up showing up with uh some polar blasts and uh some ice quakes and stacks me up oh. with a bunch of rune chants and this is where thankfully the the deck that nathan and i had been working on uh, we had kind of planned for ice disruption. Uh, we we had a little more blues. We had some cheaper cards, um, just some things to help us in the old him match and possibly the Icelander match. So that game ended up being because uh, we were able to play through the disruption. Uh, ended up having to. Bu- um, gamble on a, a Sonata that whiffed, and uh, if the Sonata hit, we would have been able to thread in well over lethal and um, strip some cards from their hand, but uh, alas, um, we weren't able to do anything on that turn, and that's where we lost our 1cc mm-hmm. round early on. Um, going into the draft rounds, uh, we actually started off super rough on draft. We, in the first draft, uh, we drafted Icelander in both drafts, but in the first one, we were... Oh, yeah, because Canadian Nats was structured a little differently than uh, U.S. Nats with the smaller player count. Uh, we went uh, three rounds of CC to start day one, followed by six rounds of draft, so it was like nine rounds day one. And then to go into day two, there was actual no no cut into day two. All players were welcome to play the, the last three rounds, but th- three rounds of CC, but there were only three rounds of CC day two, and then it was yeah. a cut to top eight. Okay. So in the first pod, uh, we... Well, yeah, so we drafted Icelander in both pods. In the first pod, we... Saw the signals that Icelander might be open, but kind of were like hesitating and we were like, oh, we should stay open a little bit longer. And ultimately we were punished for it. Um, had a subpar Icelander deck in the first pod, ended up going one and two uh, with losses in the first two rounds of the draft. Uh, and yeah, just like our, our deck was inefficient and didn't have the, um, didn't have the flexibility with enough play. I only had 31 playables in total, so I didn't really have any sideboard and I had to like run cards like dampen in my main board and it just, it wasn't pretty. Um, e. but we I got it. Is damp- dampen that bad? Blue dampen's nice in the mirror, uh, when they go huzzah and you go in response, I'm going to dampen and they go, oh no, dampen resolves first. And Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. beyond that, I don't really like dampen because it's very easy to play around. I think otherwise, I think there's, I think dampen could be interesting Kano mirror tech in CC where like your opponent can be like, uh, on your turn, Aether wildfire and maybe you like hit a dampen off the top and you let the wildfire resolve and then you hit them with the dampen for a large number and then it prevents a large number of arcane um it's an idea i've been toying around with but beyond that i don't really like dampen a whole lot it's just too easy to too easy to play around uh but we did in in that first pod manage to get a win in the last round in the wizard mirror uh we had the the spellfire cloak and we actually it's funny we lost the dice roll but they chose to go first which the more i play that match the more i'm like you know what i think you actually want to go second and play to just absolute tempo and that's exactly what happened in that match i was just able to tempo them out and going into that last round in the first pod i definitely thought like i was already on a 3-3 record and i thought i was no, I was on it. Sorry, going into that last round, it would have been two and three, and I thought I was done. Like I thought my contention for top eight was over. Uh, but we got a win in that last round, putting us at uh, in that last round of the first pod, putting us at three three. 
uh going into the second pod we this time it was funny we forced icelander right off the bat we pack one picked one a ice eternal we were just like yolo we're gonna do this and it worked out for us we managed to 3-0 the second pod and finish the first day uh 6-3 so yeah, baby Going into going into day two, um, a strong performance in in CC would actually get us if we could win out uh, would get us um, top eight. In the first two rounds on the day, um, I played uh, an old him, then in then a Bravo, and Nathan and I had come up with decent sideboard strategies for both those heroes. Uh, were able to well, it's funny actually, like. Uh, we had to play a whole bunch of Tome of the Ark Knights to kind of win both those matches, and we just kept hitting the Tome of the Ark Knights. So I think maybe there was a lucky horseshoe somewhere that helped us get into <laughs> uh, into our last round, round uh, uh, round twelve, where we were in round twelve was a win and in for top eight, and uh, yeah, that was a, a really close match against. Uh, um. Against a Reinar, so uh, that was Ian, Ian Smith. Smith that Reinar. was the one where, yeah. So Ian Smith, it was it, that round was either me or Ian Smith was going to top eight. Uh, couldn't yeah. be both of us, unfortunately. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, and I already talked about this in the last episode a little bit. He ended up getting us with a back to back reckless swings on like yep. two the, two subsequent the reckless turns. Swing for four. Yep. Like who plays around double reckless swing? Apparently, it's something you need to. Um, because I thought if I played around one, I would be fine. Uh, uh, yeah, and uh, so yeah, because of all how that played out at the end, I ended up finishing up in, yeah, like we said, 11th place. Um, pretty proud of the performance. It, it stings a little bit that we were be. so close to top eighting, it and does. we just just had to get that one more win if we could have found it somewhere else and they're like i i can look back on the day and see a lot of the mistakes i made and it's like oh if we could have just found one more win somewhere we would have been in there um but despite I that you. i feel you at a much smaller scale though but i do <laughs> i do feel you yeah tommy you have you got a lot of stuff going on you just came back from nats uh um, before before we talk nats you you have a new podcast out it's live it's on youtube it's a video it's your face it's your closet uh it is the bud rush bellows tell me tell me about the new show the bud rush uh yeah yeah well well first of all i guess i haven't really had a chance to thank you guys for having me on and also congrats adam on the 11th i mean you know obviously it'd been great for you to top eight there but you know uh i i you know, Reinar is going to do Reinar things, I guess, and, yeah. and that's just tough. Yeah. And um, but you you played one hell of a weekend, um, and it just it just goes to show that you're you got the stuff, my friend. And um, thanks, I'm, Tommy. I'm excited to see what else you do. But yeah, thank you guys for having me on. Yeah, I have a new podcast called The Bud Rush Bellow. Um, basically, you know, I, Fresh and Buds is is you know, I I, I love doing it. We're recording episode fifty nine after this. Uh, I, I finished this podcast, and you know, it's a it's very much a guest focused show, and uh, that's great. And I think it's a great way to f- focus on people around the community, uh, people that I, I you know enjoy spending time with and talking to, and I think other people should hear what they have to say. And uh, kind of give them a platform, and uh, I love doing that. But I also <clears throat> am a creative person at heart, and I, I wanted to do something uh, uh, maybe a little bit more silly or, or a little bit, um, a little bit more focused on just entertainment, right? And and I, I made the decision to do live because I, I feel like I wanted to bring the energy of the buds discord, like the discord for the the podcast to like the people out there. And if I can have people in the chat kind of like talking, you know, during the show and I can interact with them every once in a while, I think that's really fun. And I get to talk about personalities that are in the discord and hopefully get people to want to come in there because I think it's really something that's great. Uh, and I think it's a lot of friendships have come out of there, and and I think it's a positive place to be in this community, which is uh, I think is pretty important, you know. And uh, having a lot of fun over there, you know. It's Wednesdays, nine thirty Eastern, and uh, I'm joined by 
uh, Ahmad and a, and a close personal friend of mine, Gary. You might know him as Mr. Viz. Uh, if you see him on Twitter or anything like that, he is the guy with the Viscerai waifu pillow. Um, you know, we got to keep it weird over there. So uh, he, he's there with us. But yeah, it, no, yeah. thank you um, for letting me shout that out. Not a problem. Let's talk a little bit about Gary. There was a cosplay contest at uh, at the, the calling slash nationals here, and Gary was a contestant in there. And this cosplay contest was was fantastic. It had Gary as the Rune Chant fanboy, I believe was the official title, in full purple man green screen suit, his waifu pillow. He had a full choreographed dance to I Need a Hero. Oh, and, man. <laughs> and I don't know, I don't know how much he was able to speak on the actual depths of the detail of his costume. But if you noticed his outfit that he was wearing, he had a custom shirt and pants and hat uh, with the arcane writing. In it, he he has he has translated the flesh and blood arcane language fully, and now he can he can now write in arcane. And his shirt was top to bottom arcane. Uh, so I don't know if I'm spilling too much too much beans here, but <laughs> the actual. Go ahead. You look like you're about to say something, Don. Oh no, I, I was going to say. I mean, this this is this is Gary, right? You know, it's yes. It's, it is it's never just a little it's all the way you know and yes. and he go big, or go, he's, home. <laughs> go big or go home and yeah that you are very correct he learned the language the rune chant language from the game flesh and blood and yep. knows how to write it he'll just hang out and just write it mm-hmm. um well, he's he's going to be on the podcast this week and like the uh, fresh and buds we're going to talk in depth um i he hasn't really divulged a lot about what was going on with it but we're going to get into that but i know that there were I'll, some um I'll let, shout I'll outs let, in rune chant language yes i i will just say i i know what is on that shirt so we'll save it for your interview with him if he so chooses to divulge but when i found out i was absolutely floored by what, what was on the shirt so everyone who's interested i have now there's the there's the lead there's the tag go check out the fresh and buds podcast and hear uh what gary has to say about oh, yeah. rune chant writing because teaser it is it is fantastic it is so <laughs> fantastic uh tell me tell me about tell me about your weekend as a as a flesh and blood player well as a flesh and blood player i was very ecstatic to qualify for nats first of all um, it had been like a year in the making, you know, I, I, I qualified at the same store that I played my first event, which also happened to be a, uh, road to Nats back in August or maybe early September of, uh, last year. And it felt very good. And I, and I did qualify with Leviah, which was, which was awesome. It was very exciting because I've been playing Leviah for a very long time. And, you know, there's a lot of doubters and there's a lot of haters and um, th- there might be some validity to the doubt for sure. You know, I play the deck quite a bit and I, I, I recognize the, the the downfalls of the deck. It's certainly powerful, but, you know, if it kills you, uh, it kills you. And, and, and that is something that you have to reconcile with. Now, after Pro Tour Leal, when Prism got banned... Uh, or hit living legend. Uh, I was at a crossroads because I had fully planned on playing Leviah in Nats um, at the time because it was a very similar meta, and uh, and I was hoping that Prism wouldn't hit, and then Prism did hit. So once that happened, I was put in this position where it looked like it was a lot of disruption, a lot of old and a lot of Icelander, and that's still very true. But uh, initially, after the first couple of weeks, it looked like, you know, things like Phi and Viscerai and Briar weren't really going to compete necessarily. Now, that proved to be not true, which is why I eventually uh, sleeved Leviah back up 
you know, in, in testing, I had found that I was able to mitigate uh, the Oldham matchup, and I felt that I could also have a pretty decent Icelander matchup. Those those really come down to playing tight. So if I if I knew in my gut that I could play tight in those matchups, I I knew I could win. And um, yeah, so I sle- I sleeved her up for the 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 Nats. Unfortunately, I ended up uh, three and four, not good enough for day two. The draft was uh, was brutal. One and two in the draft. I was on Dromai, you know, and uh, I think in in hindsight, I was looking at the deck that I drafted. It was, I was in the right deck, but I think I was a little, uh, a few too many two blocks, you know, in the deck than I than I'd care to have, and also some not so efficient yellows. I was a little short on centipies, but you know, had like six dragons, so. You know, it was it was all of a matter of getting to those dragons, and and uh, unfortunately, this limited format can come down to the coin flips sometimes. You know, if if you don't if you don't win the die roll, it can be tough to climb out of that hole. Um, but uh, I felt the deck was fine, but it could have been um, better, and it, it it should have played at two two one, and uh, it played at one and two, and that kind of is a tough hole for. Felt it was a tough hole for myself going into the CC rounds. I went two and two in CC, which was, was fine. I, there was, uh, some tough losses. One of my losses was to a Reinar, won the die roll, um, went first, did 13 damage to me on turn one. So it's a tough, it's a tough, uh, yeah, yeah. um, you know, th- there's a certain amount of no blocks in Levia and they happened to be the ones that weren't intimidated. So, um, you know, it, it, them's the breaks, as they say. And uh, uh, I, as, as disappointing as it was not to make day two, uh, I wasn't too discouraged. I was excited to play the calling. I made some changes to the deck, um, took in, took out some stuff, put in some some other stuff. In in, in my deck building choice, I, I I realized I punted big time in deck building. Uh, I think in in the end, um, I should have. It, and it sounds crazy. Now that we've had Crown of Providence for a couple months and it's such an optimal like card to play, especially in the head slot, that I looked at my deck and was like, well, I should have sleeved up Arcanite Skullcap. I should have made room for it as well. And it's very much the truth because it it's so important in, in this these Kadachi Fi matchups yep. and 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 uh that that was a mistake on my part too. Uh I ended up going four and three in the calling. Two of my losses were to Phi. One was Kadachi Phi. The other one was Phoenix Form Phi that really <laughs> went wild and and like it's very like combo heavy uh, or not combo the mechanic but combo in terms of getting those Phoenix Forms to go off. And that was a shame to win that one. I that was like I I that one felt like it was so out of my control. I sat at the table after the guy left and like looked into space for five minutes and uh, really reconsidered yeah. my life choices. But uh, I I ended up in in the testing that I did that um, I felt like the Oldham match was very winnable and I did win some Oldham matchups. I only lost one Oldham matchup and that was um, to just whiffing and mm-hmm. is what it is. That's what Levi does. And yeah, but overall on the weekend uh, I felt I felt good in the end. Like the the silver lining was I felt that I played competitively in a pro level event. My first pro level event. I'm I'm assuming Nats is pro level or close enough to pro level. And um uh I, I'm I'm happy with it. That means that I do have something and that I can continue to improve upon. So uh, you know, other than that, I mean it was it was good to be there and just like kind of be around, you know, a lot of people that I love to hang out with and and uh and, and play some play some games and and i felt feel like normally i would be so sick of the game after a weekend like that um i i the whole ride home yesterday eight hours i was thinking about um putting remembrance into Leviah and making that work so that's what i'm doing right now uh, <laughs> but you know that's 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 where i'm at now it, that was it was a fun weekend though how about you it definitely was <clears throat> well i drafted 
<laughs> I, I played I played limited. <laughs> I, I drafted uh I actually pulled out my pod my pod list here to see who I drafted with. Um so <clears throat> I drafted my pool was uh Jeff Morvan, Chris Brummett, who I believe top eight at the calling. Okay. Um Timothy Long, Jacob Shaker, top eight Pro Tour New Jersey. Uh Phil Hensley, Nam Vo, uh a little little known guy uh <laughs> plays plays cards with the team card guys, I believe is one a calling playing limited. Uh <laughs> <laughs> and uh Aiden Annable. Enable? An Annable? Sorry, Aiden, if I'm saying your name wrong. Um, but I know three of the, I know three of those guys on that list. And I, I Jake Shaker, Namvo, and Chris Brummett. I believe is a team ascent guy uh, as well. Um but I was seat seat three. Um I I said I said this whole time that I was gonna force fi no matter what, because that was gonna be just the easy thing for me to do. And um, pack one, pick one. There was like there was nothing. <laughs> there was there was so there was less than nothing. Not even a draconic, like a good draconic card. Um, I think the only ninja card was like a yellow lava vein, and I just wasn't there yet. So um, I actually kind of forget what my pack one, pick one uh, was, but it was like a ember maw. Like it was something. It was a super obvious illusionist pick. It may have even been a red rake, but. I picked an illusionist card and I'm like, okay, <laughs> let's see what happens. And I kept in, as the cards were coming, illusionist cards were being handed to me. And so I picked them and I, I picked uh, my, my, my first pack was almost, it didn't feel like I had a ton of reds, but I had a ton of illusionist cards. So I had a bunch of sweeping blows and dust ups of all sorts a uh, couple rakes, uh, not so much on the dragon side, but uh, yellow, yellow ember maws, a couple reds. Like I felt like felt I, I felt like illusionist was coming to me. Uh, I did not want to pivot at that point. By pick five, I was like, all right, I'm in. Let's see, let's see if I can do this. Um, and I was rewarded with sticking to it because pack two, I opened a dragon. Pack one or pick one, and uh, pack two, I got handed four more dragons. After that, uh, on top of all the other illusionist cards that was coming to me, um, so I ended up I ended up with a total pool of there was 42 cards in in the pool. Uh, I think four of them were non illusionist cards when it was all said and done, uh, and one was an Oasis Red Oasis Respite, one was a uh, Red Scar for Scar, and then two Wizard Chaff cards that were like you know pack for uh, pick 14, right? So. Once it was all said and done, we figured out that the pod the pod was four four two by Dromai and uh an Icelander, which I feel like is correct. It just it means I, I drafted my seat correctly at that point. Um so then I had to <laughs> I had to figure out what like how to register the, the cards and all that stuff. We went through that process and then I, I started my first round and it was against Namvo and it was the mirror. He was the other Dromai. So he was passing the shitty dragons and he was grabbing up all the red ember moss that I, I wasn't seeing. Um, but I also completely punted because I didn't realize I didn't have my Helios until there's some some wacky happened during registration. And I like my flames and Helios were left. A, a, just afloat somewhere in, in the abyss. So uh, when we sat down and put everything out, I did not have a headpiece. And so I did not play round one with a headpiece. Nam went second. I went first and only had, like, I think I had a blue dust up. And he responded with Helios, pitched a bunch of red cards, created four ash, and uh, that was about it. <laughs> was, uh, we we made it, made it close number wise. And I think I like uh, there was the potential for me to be able to pivot, but um, it just wasn't, it wasn't meant to be. So he smacked me around. I played a close game against a Fi. Uh, smack me around a bit, but I still I got close. And then third round, I punted because I don't know. I from what I'm told, I drafted a very good deck, but I don't know how to pilot. This is literally the first time I played Dromai ever, and um, so I went 0-3 in the draft. I was hoping I knew it was going to be tough, but I wanted one 
just to sneak it out, but it didn't happen. So 0-3 on the draft, so I need to go 4-0 to day two. Um, CC was where I was I was tr- really trying to go. Um, I brought George Rogers, UK Phylist, uh, with me for CC. Um, that was actually super close to where I was in testing. And <clears throat> Adam, you talk about Nathan Fortin helping build this. He actually helped uh, helped me with Phi before uh, before I started experimenting with the Calling Singapore list. And we had actually, um, through his advice, at, actually had introduced ourselves, Enlightened Strikes and Ravenous Rabbles, and were shifting over to Kadachi um, at the time. So we were very close to where um, where that George Rogers list was, but we hadn't quite gotten down the Kadachis yet. But... Nathan was right there with the with the insight on how how what I wanted out of the deck and how to get there best. And a lot of that was taking out those conditional like I still had a lot of conditional draconic go agains, but I wanted, you know, my philosophy in the last couple like since the ban has been right break points, something more than just head jab dot deck uh, and um, and it was his insight that that got me to uh, to that kind of synergistic value phi that I had been playing with. So George Rogers is kind of the culmination of of that list there, where it's just super high threat density, super super consistent. Um, I was testing this, and I had tracked that I missed eighteen of twenty Tome of the Ark Knights that I played in, in testing, and so I was I just wasn't. I wasn't going to do that to myself at Nats, so uh, I went with I went Phi uh, doing that. But uh, round one against Vis murdered them. I don't know. I just I, I was eating Rune Blades all uh, all weekend. Um, they had brought a uh, they tried a Mordred tied into a Sutcliffe's research notes, Ooh. but whiffed <laughs> whiffed on the Sutcliffe's. But I was like I had to read that card. Uh, and reread it to figure out what was going on there. But he, re- if you reveal an attack action, you gain a rune chance. So Mordred out, you gain two. So if he gained, if he revealed three attacks, he would have gotten six rune chance off of Mordred, and uh, and he got three non attacks, and that was it. I that that game ended me up fifteen nothing. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, uh, the next round I played against a Phi. Uh, it was, he, he, he went second, it was a race and, uh, I, it really came down to, uh, just not enough. I had an E-Strike. I, the E-Strike's great. It's not great when you need to not cost the card. So it was just one of those, those things where those, those kind of percentage plays matter. And I had to lose a card in order to keep attacking. And that card would have, I think, kept parity with tempo and giving me a fighting chance, but because I, I couldn't attack with one more card. It, it, that was, you know, it, that was my out and I couldn't, I couldn't get there, uh, there. So, uh, another, another this, I faced out Al- Alberto Ruiz. If you remember from calling Indianapolis, there was a stream game in round four against Katsu versus Bravo. And it was Clark Jansen, friend of the channel on Bravo versus a Katsu that was piloted by that very same Alberto Ruiz. And I told, I gushed over, I was like, I was rooting for you so hard uh, in that match. <laughs> um, he, he again was on this and uh, Fi, I just, I was, I was, feed me aggro, feed me rune blades. Uh, I got him uh, pretty handedly and was happy with that. And uh, my last game on Nats was a uh, Briar who had a channel Mount Heroic. I went first. He had a channel in hand, wanted to keep it, and took nine damage to keep it, and too much. So he played his channel, didn't last long enough, and I just won the race because he gave me the head start. So them's, uh, as, as Tommy says, them's the breaks there. Um, did not, so ended five, ended three and four I needed that win in draft. Couldn't get it. Um, had to be perfect in CC. Wasn't. Um, so 3-4 in Nats. Uh, moved to the calling. Uh, ended the day 4-3 uh, at the calling. I was 4-2. My losses were in rounds 3 and 4 to a Bravo in a super close match. Um, I ended up getting 
uh, getting kind of greedy and and it and it cost me. Uh, Bravo was able to kind of. I I went to I went to really seal the deal with an Art of War, and I I I pitched and banished my good red cards and hoped to draw other good red cards and just give them plus one. And instead, I drew a blue in a defense reaction. So it, it kept him in the game, and then he was able to pivot pivot off of that. So. Uh, Bravo took that one. I did open. I opened up against a Reinar. I thought I was going to punt because I forgot to Snapdragons uh, a Salt Wound. Uh, I had a big. I had a big turn. I got a Mass Trigger. Uh, I had a Salt the Wound for five. I ancestraled it, uh, made it six, and I had a Red Soul Bead and a Lava Burst in hand. And he had one card. He could not block the rest of it. Uh, and then we just went to damage. Instead of instead of continuing, like I didn't hold priority in Snapdragons, and I thought that was it. I arsenaled one card, pocketed the other, uh, drew up, and he promptly CNC'd and pummeled uh, those cards out uh, of the game. Uh, but I was able to recover and uh, and pull it out against Reinar. Uh, I outraced a Fi. I lost a Bravo. I lost to an Icelander, gambled on a hypothermia being an arsenal, and I lost, needed it to not be there, and it was when it when he needed it to be. Um, I took one on a uh, beat another Briar and beat a Viscerai uh, to make it 4-2, and then uh, my winning in was against a Reinar, and his turn zero was uh, Blood Rush Bellow, Barraging Beat Down Yellow, Roll Scabskins, hit a four, get two action points. Swing club and so intimidate twice. I had an even bigger than that and a ravenous rabble in my hand. So block two took eight and then followed up with a swing big for ten. Oof. And uh and that was that was that was it really. Um I freaked out, I blocked with armor, shouldn't have blocked with armor. I don't know if it would change the like the true outcome of the game, but I put Shuko and Tunic in front of it just to kind of stave off the bleeding. But I started I started the game at 25 life. Um, I caught up a little bit, uh, but he I was at nine and he had a um, a red barraging into an alpha rampage, and uh, I only had a uh, blaze headlong and then the mask to block with. So block four, take nine. That was lethal. That was that was my day. That was the calling. It's pretty right brutal. There. Now All I right. do want to say, Pat, and, and for the folks at home listening, this this guy, you know, leading up to the Nats, it's like I, I hate limited, I hate draft. He he drafts like what I would call like a eight point five, maybe a nine out of ten draw my deck. And then oh threes with it. I was like, no, what are yep. you doing? Yep. <laughs> yep. I was like, give me it. I'll take it. And, yeah, um, any anybody else could have <laughs> could have taken a win. But that that really was that was a two one three oh deck. I'm convinced of it. Um, oh yeah. It was. But but not not in my hands. <laughs> I warned I warned everybody. <laughs> uh, uh, hopefully next time you know, we get some more reps in. On, uh, yeah, yeah, so, you know, and that was the thing, right? So, like, during, even, like, going into the third round, like, I was learning the deck, right? So, I I completely punted round one against Namvo, but I saw what he was doing and, like, picked up a few things, right? And then the second game, the second game in draft was actually very close. It it came down to one of those things where I had a blue rake the rake the embers and he was at 10 and I had four ash wings out and I was able to I had a scar for scar and a pitch card right if I had another if another color rake the embers in arsenal I pitched I played the rake the embers I I think I even pitched a red I it might have been a cover dust cover something like that but um I pitched a red created an ash um played the blue rake created one ash wing and then played a scar for scar he took it and then i he he was at 10 scar for scar for four five ash wings he took it all went to one didn't lose a card from his hand and and then that was that that was it right so that i came close the third round i needed to know the the deck a lot better to discover the lines that i wanted Mm -hmm. to play I had three yellows and a red, and I was convinced that I could do something with that hand. So I ate like ten damage. Uh, and when when it was time to clap back, I realized that I couldn't do what I wanted to do. Uh, and 
I should have just blocked with with the cards and and retreated at that point. Um, so that that cost me the game. I'm convinced if I had three more rounds with Joe Mai, I feel like it would have been in a good spot. Uh, the same thing happened in the side event that that we did team we did team uprising sealed um and even understanding phi like luke luke our 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 partner thank you luke for helping us out and being part of the team i know luke um but he uh <clears throat> when he was talking about starters and just like uh like efficiency of the phi deck i i had put in three i think it ended up being four total two cost cards i had like a uh, flame wave and two rebellious rushes, and then a blue rebellious, uh, a blue flame wave for the ex- for a sideboard card for against Icelander. Um, but in in the first two games that I played, I was playing clunky. Like I found those cards, and playing two cost ninja cards just weren't weren't where it's at. So <clears throat> after the first game, I sided all of them out and just put one cost cards that I initially were like, eh, I don't want to yellow soaring strike you know or you know insert insert card that i didn't think initially was good but zero and one cost even if they were just two and three tech i put them in and the deck started zooming uh much better and so understanding the builds and limited and how they differ from uh you know from a cc perspective and then the lines of those limited decks is something that i probably could have I feel good about my chances if I could get four or five drafts under my belt. So mm-hmm. we know for next time that, oh, yeah. you know, I, I could be there. I could be there. I didn't hate drafting either. Like I, I felt like <laughs> I was, <laughs> I was very focused on what I was doing. So I wasn't so much picking up on like this, on the signals, so to speak of of my partners but I, or like my table but i do know i was passing a lot of ice so icelander had to have been open on uh on my right i believe or left i don't know but icelander was open uh because i kept passing those cards and there were some good ones there um i know phi was open because i passed the spreading flames in pack three um and i almost almost hate drafted it would you hate draft the spreading flames depends what else i have in the pack honestly and where my drafts at like do i have do i already have the cards i need where i can afford to take this pick and to not have it uh um, i definitely could uh, but is it worth it is, is is hate drafting a majestic like that worth worth the card slot i don't I think personally no no i don't no. think so i think it's it's so tough to cuz like you're almost making a bet that you're going to play the person if if that makes sense yeah. and yeah. you're and and, yeah. and then you're on top of that you're making a bet that you can't enhance your deck with a card from that pack yeah um no if it was like a like well, i don't know like a shuko mm-hmm. have at it you know that right, that's right, like right, a game changing right. card right blocks yeah. too but yeah yeah definitely um, yeah, so that that's kind of our our Nats experiences there. It was it, it was nice hanging out with everybody. Um, it was nice seeing. We saw the uh, Logan and Jordan from uh, Fresh and po- Flesh and Pod, the Fappers. Um, over there, it was nice to actually see those guys in person. Abby was not there this weekend, I believe. Right? I didn't see yeah, her. No, no. Um, Jordan but it was came nice out with his dad. It was nice to see Jordan and Logan. Uh, got to hang out with Elaine. Uh, it was nice to hang out with her. She was going to be our partner for the for the team sealed event, but she went to drop after they had paired up the, or put the pods together for the second draft in the Battle Harden, and they basically said, "Don't you dare!" Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, you know, the odd thing though is I I went around the Battle Harden tables for the second draft, and there was a few seven seven table seven person drafts happening uh happening there so i think we could have could have taken her yeah um but it was it was good we had uh keith from the realm games hanging out he was judging all weekend i believe as well um uh flake armada was hanging out afterwards uh as well those guys are great uh dm armada of course coming on to the show next week hashtag shameless plug um but yeah it was it was good i love I love, 
look, I love you. I love I love these people. I get I I don't get to go out terribly often, and uh, I I don't have. I don't have I don't have friends really around. Yeah, I'm a dad. I work a lot. I play flesh and blood in my spare time. I don't I don't go to bars. I don't I don't talk to a ton of people. So, you know, you're you're my friend. Max Max Thomas is a good friend of mine, and got to see him do really well in the calling, and it was exciting for me to kind of be able to root root him on as he was going. Uh, going on him and Fino Black had a crazy match on the top table, I believe in round four or five mm-hmm. in the calling, but it was it was nuts. It went to it went to time and Max had conceded uh, there was no there was no way for him to deal to lethal in any amount of time. But it was just, you know, some high level play happening. Max is one of the better players. He doesn't get nearly enough credit for that. Um, but it was definitely Absolutely. awesome. Awesome to see uh, everybody. Come yeah, no, I wanted to touch on like kind of like hanging out with folks and <laughs> friends. Um, I think it's a beautiful thing about this community, right? You know, I I look around even even beyond our circles, I, I see people hanging out in these groups and 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 kind of really enjoying themselves at these events, and doesn't feel like a slog, if that makes sense. And maybe yeah. maybe mm-hmm. it's it's um, a fluke or something like that, but. Um, I, I find that it's a very positive place to kind of congregate with people. And, uh, you know, it, it's t- like you said, your, your dad, uh, you know, you, you work a lot. Um, I, I don't even see my like personally, I, I hardly see my real friends or my high school friends mm-hmm. and stuff like that anymore. Right. You know, it's adult mm-hmm. life. And, you know, this is the beautiful thing about a hobby is that we get to kind of like chill and and like it's more than just flesh and blood right because mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We're, we were chilling at the that place world of beer and just yeah yep hanging out and i don't we, we talked a little bit of flesh and blood we talked about all kinds of stuff it was it was a uh, it, it was cool it felt it felt genuine and and real yeah it was definitely right it, it was that kind of unloading experience being able to sit back and relax at the end of a long day with just the people that that you like you know and uh yeah and just uh, Mara from Blackwing Studios kicking ass mm-hmm. in nationals the whole weekend. It was awesome to to see her on that run. Got back afterwards, was able to watch her streamed limited match. Uh, there she came oh, that back. That was such a tight match. Eleven. She was at one life in Cooper Cooper Templeton, I believe, was at eleven and uh, kept the crack bobble and that that was that and i i guess she she knew that the fives were heavy in her pod so they she knew that the uh there was a potential for for fi to brick and uh, she was kind of she was biding her time and she got there and she played she played the hell out of that game um but it was fun to see mara it was fun to see mo bogsley uh uh dagan white um uh, there's a couple others, uh, Andromeda and Rabbit, of course, and Multi Bear from Buds. It was nice to see oh, yeah. all the Buds there. Of course, Gary. It was awesome to see Gary. Um, yeah, I do want to give ahead. a shout out to uh, because you know, I know we're you, you guys. Are, well, Michael Michael Hamilton's here waiting in the wings uh, to, mm-hmm. to to chat, but um, he's in the green room as we speak. He's in the green room right now, and Michael is just. Uh, the best I, I will say Michael Hamilton is the best player playing the game right now. And I know that's, this is a, that's a, it's a hot take, but he's the most, uh, I don't know if there's something about him that he just can play the game at a different level. And on top of that, I think it's worth pointing out that, and you guys will see when you hear him talk on this show. And if you listen to his podcast, if you've listened to him on other podcasts, he is not only an amazing player, but he is the sweetest guy in the world. And I think that's a a great thing to have someone playing the game like this at such a high level and winning so much that also is a good human being because it goes to show you don't need to be a jerk or anything like that when, when you're, when you're this competitive, you can be a sweet person, but beyond Michael, I do want to shout out Daniel Rakowski, uh, a, a local bud of mine and uh, that I get to play locals with all the time. And he had one hell of a run, made it to the finals of US Nats. And he was playing, he's playing like great flesh and blood right now. He had a great mm-hmm. uh, show in at Pro Tour Leo. Uh, you know, he had a uh, top finish at, uh, he, he got second Philly battle Harden earlier this year. 
you know, he, he is playing some, some great flesh and blood. And I would, I would say, look out for him in the future. He's a, he's, he, he's a great player and um, uh, I'm excited to see what else he, he, uh, he comes up with. Yeah. The, his deck is insane, by the way, I am uh, sleeving it <laughs> uh, <laughs> right now. Um, it is, it really is. It's kind of the hybrid of the best of the combo five decks and the kind of Kadachi value decks. And it kind of, it, it, you talk about right minds in the game, and you and like Michael Hamilton is on another level. Uh, we all know that. I do think that the story of Worlds is going to be Michael Hamilton and Pablo Pintor, oh, and yeah. it's going to be if they they have to be. I don't know how they get it done. But they need to just be on the opposite ends of the of whatever brackets they're in, so that we see we see the final that we all want to see, and crown the best player in the world between the two best players in the world. And man, won't that be a moment if that if that ends up happening? That would be incredible. What does that there. mean? Right now, I would say between the two of them, right? You know, the, mm-hmm. every, all eyes are on worlds, right? There's yeah. no doubt about that. Now, the question is, of the two of them, who is the better blitz player? And, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, I don't know. My, you know, as much as, you know, shout out to Michael. I think he's a great player. I mean, my bet is on the European because I think blitz is a, a big European format. So, we yeah. Have, yeah. Who knows? I mean, this this could be it, It'll but be interesting. You know. It'll be interesting to see what I think Hamilton would pick up an ice hero there, but it'll be interesting to see if he tries Blitz Icelander or Blitz Oldham. That'll be yeah. Oldham I... is still Oldham dominant in in the Blitz format. Uh, before we transition back over to CC, I don't think anything has changed. I don't know if that Icelander build works in Blitz, but you never know. Yeah, I believe. Uh, that Boldham is very close to LLing in, in Blitz, but I don't know if he can before Worlds. No, no, he can't. He can't touch it. There's not going to be an opportunity for the Blitz heroes. Um, regardless, I don't think that there'll be a hero, an opportunity moving forward for any of them to gain more LL points until Worlds. So I think we're looking at we're looking at the the meta uh, as as it sits. Mm-hmm. Um. But uh, to to the point that I was making, Dan Rakowski um, did a Q&A on the main Discord on the Fi channel and uh, basically did a, you know, ask me anything on there. And it was breaking down some of his choices and uh, just talking about thinking about the game on another level. Mm-hmm. He, he was talking about the interaction between Flame Call Awakening and Enlightened Strike, and it it, it hurt me to like put those two together and realize like, yes, of course, of course. It, like play, right. For those who are not in the, in the know, you play a red card, but you play a red card for a flame, then play flame call awakening. It costs one. So you pitch something um, to pay for it, or maybe you use tunic, whatever you're going to do. Flame call awakening says that if you played a red card uh, this turn, uh, when you play Flame Call Awakening, when you attack with Flame Call Awakening, if you played another red card this turn, you may re- reveal and search your deck for a Phoenix Flame, uh, reveal it, put it into your hand, and then shuffle, right? Which means it seems okay enough in a in a Draconic Phi deck. But then you add Enlightened Strike to it, and all of a sudden, Enlightened Strike doesn't cost you a card anymore. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It's, it's, it's incredible, man. You tuck the flame. Who the... I would. I tell you what. I was not there. I was not there. And to just just put those together when he said that, my my mind just exploded. <laughs> and it just that's that's a part of the game that I I want to I want to understand how these players get there. Uh, and you know I and I you know I think Adam is Adam is there. Nathan is there. Right there. You just have you, you get a mind for it. I don't know if it's just reps. There's so much. <clears throat> there's so much of this like hive mind mentality in this damn game, where if your math isn't perfect with just this 
tight list of cards, right? Here, I am Icelander. I play ice. I play an elemental wizard. Nothing else is considered. Learn this match as it is. And it takes, like, how long to put in a friggin' right, epoch or, or whatever. That is the change that's considered innovation. And these these guys ignore that. And I feel like there's not there's not enough of that window for for innovation in some of some of the groups around around there. And I think that's some of the, I think one of my biggest problems with like the main main discord, the international discord, is mm-hmm. that you get a lot of that that hive mind. Hey, what did we think about this card? This card is not mathematically good into this deck because it's only plus three minus a card, netting two minus a life plus this. Like it doesn't it doesn't add up. But then you like to for Hamilton to throw in Wounded Bull and Fighting Spirit as a as cards in his deck and E strikes and just just the simple statement of I'm taking out the the crappy wizard red cards i was playing and just putting solid attacks uh that take advantage of my lower life total in and, and it's like yeah what yeah, yeah. yeah of course take but take not- the worst thing about icelander and use it as an advantage which is like it's it sounds simple when you say it but nobody was right. doing it really i mean some people right. maybe we're trying it out but like gosh i mean it it, it was so impressive that deck and because beyond that, right? It it's like, well, why? Like, well, some of these these cards are inefficient, right? Like, they they cost mm-hmm. a lot. Well, you're playing a ton of blues in this deck anyway, man. Right. You know, it, like <laughs> that's what you want to play in Icelander. So it it, yeah. it just it was like the the missing piece, which is so cool. Yeah, and it, it like it takes so much to get to a certain right. You have to you have to build the deck. You have to be comfortable with it and then you got to wrap it out and then you ha- like you have to master the deck and then but to do that and then change cards from it and then experiment that's where i i that's i'm gonna ask i'm gonna ask mike once he gets out of the green room uh and sits, <laughs> here, and sits here at the table um you know that's one of the things i i want to ask him because i i don't know i can i can theory craft all day Right, but the opp- the opportunity, even with Talishar, to like get get the reps that you think are adequate enough to understand what this card is or is not doing in the deck. It just it just seems like you know it's like thinking about traveling to the moon just to get to that point. It's just I can't even think about it. Uh, it's just so much, so big, so out of reach. Um, well, I right, will say I, that. That those two guys being in, in, in the finals of US Nats with this like really kind of like innovative deck building choices mm-hmm. is is a is a net positive for the game because it kind of puts on show that we can start thinking about the game beyond the hive mind as you said like we have this mm-hmm. hive mind mentality we see it be a thing you know like we could see that you can break beyond the the traditional thought processes in Mm -hmm. deck building in this game. And I think it's awesome that we had two great examples of it in the finals of U.S. Nationals, the, I guess, the largest nationals in in, in the world. 435 registered players for U.S. Nats. Which was great. And and, uh, that's that's awesome. And, uh, yeah, hopefully we see a lot more innovation. I do. My hot take is that the world championship will be won by in in innovation we have not seen yet. Uh, I think I think that Meta is in a perfect place right now to to open to to open the door for that that conversation and that exercise. I think it's it's ripe to ripe to find out. Someone's going to flex their deck building muscles here and take advantage of it at Worlds. Yeah, you have to, right? You have to to kind of hedge against the 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 very stiff competition in in these these tournament fields. Um, I wanna I wanna I wanna talk about where where we're staying. So, world is coming up. We got the you got the fall brawl, uh, battle hardened uh, out in Ohio. <clears throat> what does what is what is the 
competitive landscape look like for Adam Philip Chuck right now? What is what's the outlook here? Uh, well, we, I guess, yeah, today's the 27th, uh, so ratings for, for Worlds locked in yesterday, I believe, on the 26th? Yes, yep, Worlds is, is locked, let's, so, let's see. had a look at that, and I'm in 41st place, so I'm locked for Worlds. There you go, congratulations. Thank you're you. You're in Worlds, you're, you're going to the World Championship. Yeah, um, still, I mean... I, if I look back at where the, when this journey started and for a while there, my goal was just to play on the first pro tour and we got there and then it was, okay, let's see if we can make the second pro tour happen. And then somewhere throughout there, we were like, Hey, let's see if we can qualify for worlds. And now that we've hit that, it's kind of like, okay, what's the, what's the next big step? I'm, I mean, we, we did have the, the near, uh, the near top eight at Canadian Nationals. So now I'm starting to tinker around with those ideas. Like, am I actually good enough to do those things? Um, yes. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm there. There's times where I'm still not so certain. Like, we have moments where we're like, okay, we're we're doing okay at this game, and then we we have moments where it's like, like we were trying to see. We we decided to play Viserai for for Nationals because it was a comfort pick, but we wanted to play Icelander. And then I, I look at like what Michael Hamilton was doing at the Icelander and like I'm I'm just sitting there playing checkers and dudes playing three D chess. So <laughs> we're it's pretty spicy. In in some ways we're making strides and like we're we're becoming more and more of a contender on that big scene, but I still have a long ways to go, I think, to be a a Michael Hamilton or a Pablo Pinto or something like that, and I don't even want to come close to claiming that i i might be um, amongst the conversation of some of the better players in the world um but despite that um qualifying for worlds is it, like we're super excited about it and i think that's the big the big focus right now is just like how do we how do we get ourselves as prepared as possible for worlds we we were thinking about it and I was trying to figure out what I wanted out of Worlds, what the goal is there. And I think just to like, you know, possibly day two, finish on a positive record, that's 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 what we were we're hoping for. Um and then after that, I don't really know what comes next because I, I I assume I keep grinding on this pro circuit, but I, we don't know what twenty twenty three looks like yet, so we don't know. Um mm-hmm. Yeah, we we don't really know what comes next, and then at some point, like this, you know, it's great to like qualify for these big events, but if we're not cashing, and like th- at some point, like we got to find figure out a way to make this not profitable, but like sustainable. There we go. That's the right word. Yeah, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, so I, I long term I don't know what the competitive field looks like right now. Like we we want to keep grinding, but we're going to need to see something come through to make this. And I don't know what that something looks like cuz I think that's right. That's still like a question for future Adam to answer, but something needs to come forward to make this self-sufficient. I hear that, right? It's to get an achievement of a goal, right? And mm-hmm. that's really, I think, right? We're, we're setting setting the next goal and achieving it, and then when that turns, right, at some point that goal has to be a gold foil, right, or a PTI for a, you know, insert, you know, insert reward here, right? Yeah, yeah, something like that, and I don't even. I don't even like let's say hypothetically I get that one extra win and I top eight Canadian nationals. Sure, I have a PTI and a gold foil to my name, but like you don't even have much else beyond that. Like there's you you can sell the PTI, you can sell the gold foil. Um that buys you like I mean that pays for San Jose maybe and maybe that trip on top of that. And then it's like, hey, well what what comes next even after that like what 
I guess where I'm going with this is like, I think, you know, LSS is still very young and they still need to, like, they're still kind of establishing their, their pro circuit and they're establishing a lot of things right now. But part of what made the magic scene successful is also the fact that there was a, a long term means to an end uh, amongst that scene. And then, you know, obviously magic ended up uh-huh. kiboshing everything they had created. But, yep there was a sustainability there and i think there there was i I, and i do think i had i had mentioned this before but i i do think that once elo it once there's enough elo to establish some stability in that right elo was just updated there's still complaints about it uh uh i got a plus 42 on constructed elo hey just means just means i ruined so many people's days when i beat them <laughs> <laughs> that's all that means i I, ca- I came from nothing but i got plus uh, it was like plus 17 a win on it but uh magic it gave invites and paid for costs and appearances for their players to get to the pro tour events and i think that's where flesh and blood needs to go so it's not so much a not quite a salaried position but it allows the pro players to be professional players in the game and i think that's 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 the next step once but it, it's probably going to come through elo and they'll do platinum gold silver rank and you'll get paid appearance fee uh an invite and maybe flight and travel you know travel and lodging or something like that that's what magic used to do uh so if if flesh and blood's really taking the torch i think that's next all yeah. right um we are we're winding down here with time with uh, Tommy Fresh, so I do want to get uh, some community questions out out here before we 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 wrap things up. Uh, first, uh, from dear friend uh, Matt DeMarco, Flake of the Instant Speed Podcast, he asks, Tommy, what's more difficult to accomplish at a major event, making day two with Leviah or organizing dinner? Um, <laughs> this is actually a harder question than it should be, uh, <laughs> because the 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 dreamer in me <laughs> thinks that I like making day two at Levi. Like I was right on the cusp of making day two in both mm-hmm. the nets and calling, and we had Ethan, aka Man Sant. Shout out Ethan. Uh, he made day two of the calling with Leviah with the the recursion version, which is very cool. I can't wait to see that list. But organizing dinner is is a is a nightmare with like fifteen people that all want to hang out and all want to be somewhere. I mean we it was a miracle that we we went to uh I think it was a uh, Jim from Fab T C G cards who who saw oh World of Beers right up there. Should we check that out? And it was a miracle mm-hmm. they could sit us all. So yeah. Uh, yeah. that's that's a hard question. Uh, I'm gonna say that the day two with Levia is easier right. than organizing <laughs> dinner. <Ooh. laughs> right? Jordan walks into this this diner. It's a very it's a small diner and is just like hey. We have 15 people coming in. Can you handle it? And the and the front the hostess is like, no. <laughs> and here here are the reasons why we will not seat all 15 of you. <laughs> and it's like, all right, okay, okay. Um, all right. Next up, uh, Mr. Viz himself, Gary asks, "What's the secret to a good Jersey hoagie?" I love this question. I love food. I love hoagies. Uh, I think it really comes down to the meat, right? Because you know, a good good bread is is important, right? But but if if you have good bread and the and the meat kind of like slimy and and, and whatever, like a, I've had so many slimy turkey sandwiches and like ham and like Sounds terrible, yeah, it's so bad. But like when you when you get like like high quality like Italian prosciutto and like so prasada and all that kind of stuff you're really doing it and i think that's that's really the key you know cheese is 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 a diamond dozen i think i think you can get pretty good cheese for you know across the board but it's it's all in, it's all in the meat uh the bread comes next though because really shitty bread can can ruin your day that's true shitty bread 
is really just the downfall of society. Church <laughs> 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 really is. Just, I don't. I don't. I don't want to live here anymore. Once we can't have good. Bread. <laughs> All right. Next up is a a famous question. Uh, <laughs> it is. It is adjusted so much so that I didn't recognize it at first until Darth Prentice Greg tried to hijack the glory away. But I will not let this stand, and Capolo will be heard today. Capolo asks, When you build a Leviolist, do you have a formula for having optimal pitch each turn? Uh, this is a great question, Capolo, and I really appreciate you asking it, but unfortunately I can't answer, so um, no comment. <laughs> it's, just, it's just something you just you gotta know in your heart of hearts, right? You just you gotta know it. You gotta just gotta feel it. Just gotta that's a question it. for Arsenal Pass. Send that all along to them. They got it. <laughs> I'm sure Hayden Dale would love to dissect like the 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 ratio of blues and Levaya. Oh, yeah. yeah, I'm sure you would. Guys. They got they got all sorts of spreadsheets going on. That's the other part, right? We talk about other other like other worldly minds. We there's some the the ratio people kill me. Uh, how do you get there? Why like these are the people that put the one yellow earth or surge because it increases their chances of being able to pitch two by 05 percent, and that is like takes them over a threshold that is relevant to them. So they replace one red uh, yeah, yeah with a uh, with something yellow and and all of a sudden their deck is perfect and if you take that yellow out you're like you can't play the deck it just is unplayable at that point i don't understand but if they've got the ratio so tight that that's that seems to be the case i will say um, that um there is like some like basic math i do personally do when building a deck like, like how often do i want to draw the blue one of every once per like hand uh, 15 blues maybe not right maybe wrong maybe incorrect uh but most of it is just vibes i'm like ah that feels like the right amount and so i'm going to play it and whether it's right or or, or not i'm doing it <laughs> <laughs> that's hey you know sometimes i used to do i used to do that with lands and commander uh i mm -hmm. was the person that would play 32 lands in my non CDH deck, but I also played my deck was Yuriko. Oh, why are we talking magic? I don't know. <laughs> uh, my deck, my deck was Yuriko, uh, the the ninja, and there was a lot of revealing the top card and drawing the top card, and so like my my engine produced such that a lands are bad for Yuriko, and but like I would draw so much at that point where thirty two uh, was was not the worst thing in the world. Um, I thought I had a fourth question until I actually put the pieces of the puzzle together and realized that Darth uh, was, in fact, trying to steal Capolo's thunder. So <laughs> that does conclude the community question. Real, real, real quick, last thing, and then we'll let you go, and you can do your podcast. Is Should anything happen in the ban and uh, suspended announcement on the third? I do. I don't think so. I, I don't think there's anything supporting anything happening. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm sure there will be some voices that are loud about something like Crown of Seeds, uh, you know, and maybe even. Uh, I don't know. I can't even think of something else is really that That's problematic. The thing. I, my my only my only. I told you that it would just be really quick. I lied. Um, my my only no it's all right do you do you have to go you can go, mm, you can go. Mm -mm. okay um looking at the nationals uh metagame in two in the uh the winning metagame of weeks one and two of the 2022 national championships so this is excluding this final week which is week mm -hmm. three oldham has won 38.9% of 2022 national championships, uh, followed by Briar at 16, and then a uniform 5.6% across the board for Bravo, Dash, Dorinthia, Dromai, Fi, Icelander, Reinar, and Viserai. Are we okay with 40% of the meta being Oldham? I feel like 
we and the consensus seems to be no like we are we we are okay with it. the meta is healthy right the meta is in a great place uh everything everything is great everything is balanced everything is healthy but oldham is winning 40 percent when i say when i see that i go back to how many chains there were and how many briars there were that that fired off their bands and I believe that their market share of their respective metas were, was even less than what Oldham is doing right now. And those seem to warrant bans in one way or another. So why, what is different here? Personally, I think that the problem with those decks were that they had some really toxic, kind of game-breaking interactions and there was no shortage of of aggro decks right uh oldham mm-hmm. is 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 kind of i mean we, we have bravo and maybe you can throw an icelander in there but that's not even the same kind of thing Bra- oldham is going to serve a purpose until he's gone and i i i can't imagine really anything outside of like crown of seeds and that's such a bad decision like i think if they made that decision to do something with a a legendary is is a bad look for the game and they kind of have to just bite the bullet and wait till oldham goes but it's it's nice because i oldham is a deck that is challenging people to really build different right and 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 Mm -hmm. kind of finding a way to beat it and you look at u.s nationals right uh what was it two oldhams in, in the top eight or something like that and n- neither of them made yes. the, the finals uh two two oldhams two fives a prior two Icelanders, Icelanders and a think, dash and a dash yes take a bond dash which is like a great thing to see in the top eight mm-hmm. right yeah and it's there's no doubt that Oldham's really good and mm-hmm. and can win win events but he it's not the end-all be-all nobody's like going into a tournament and saying I'm facing all Oldhams, you know, Mm -hmm. um, there, I mean, for example, you know, I think there's just as many vices running around, at least at us Nats in the calling. It seemed like there was a lot of this and there was like that. Yeah. Yeah. Especially at the the top tables, uh, in Nats, there was, Right, and to your point there, if you take the calling and U.S. Nats in a in a vacuum, mm-hmm. there if you if you went in in those top tables, it was it was Oldham, Icelander, Fi, and Viserai, and then you saw a smattering of other stuff. But you had two you had two heroes on one end of the spectrum, really, in like the ice mm-hmm. heroes, and then you had two traditionally aggressive heroes on, on the other you had, I think, I think this was more represented in the top tables than Briar was, but Briar still had uh, an impact there. So you could, you could say rune blades, you had rune blades, Fi, you know, Gar, uh, Oldham and an Icelander really having a presence, but not in, not one overwhelmingly. So over the, uh, and I'm sorry, Dromai, Dromai yeah. was, was, was there. It did not convert in the top eight. I don't believe. But um, but was was a presence there, and it, I, I don't think it wasn't. It wasn't until the super late rounds where the Dromai pilot started to really fall off, and then and and then you start to hear how like Dromai isn't that you, you know uh, Dromai fell. I, I think while the tournament progressed, Dromai fell off the meta a little bit. <laughs> is, sure. is what I saw take place. The Dromai players got a little sick of what they were doing. It seemed like uh, except yeah. Mara. Uh, loves loves. <laughs> well, it's it's. I think uh, I think a lot of people are still understanding that it's not Prism, and they're gonna. It's not yeah. going to mm-hmm. feel the same way as Prism. But I, I think it was Jordan who tweeted, um, that across all the nationals, that I think fifteen of the sixteen here, like playable heroes, were represented in yeah. top eights mm-hmm. across the world. Yeah, and were, if were. if that's the case, I. I I could see no real reason to to do anything, and 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 even even the crown of seeds thing is is something we're used to at this point. And Oldham's just yeah. trudging along, 
at a at a decent pace, maybe a little bit faster right now towards a living legend, and that's mm-hmm. fine. That's how the game is designed. And that's how the, it's it's supposed to work. And um, based on what they've said about living legend, even recently, it sounds like that's what mm-hmm. they want. So yeah, um, yeah, no changes, please. Yeah, I agree. I don't think any changes are necessary. I think we mm-hmm. let things be where they are for now. Oldham gained 230 Living Legend points this update. Uh, this season. G- going in. I will say, and I know I'm I'm likely the minority here, uh, maybe because I have such a terrible personal matchup into Oldham, but mm-hmm. I do think that there is something to be said about, uh, like, a lot of the decisions LSS has made for Band of Suspended is, is based on uh, fun and play patterns and etc., and I I do think that there is something to be said about the fact that some heroes are some heroes are negated by Oldham still, and we knew that this would be the case. Other heroes need to be so specific and exact in their sequencing in order to create an end game state to have a chance at Oldham that it can be very frustrating to play against. And I am talking. Uh, uh, there seems to be. Uh, a breakthrough here with draconic phi into into oldham but even even before this week people we were talking about how to stack triple art of war so that you can draw it late and try still try to dodge the accidental pummel uh against oldham but to to get to that point in your deck and play it enough can be very a very frustrating and just mentally draining uh, experience. So if there was an argument to be made, the problem is, I don't know what would, what, uh, you won't stop that unless you just take Oldham away. Uh, mm-hmm. So, you know, but if if there was a way to speed up the game a little bit, just a little bit, <laughs> then I would be, I would be okay uh, with, with making a change like that. Just to speed up, just speed Oldham up a little. Um, all right. It's coming. It's coming. That's, I think we'll be fine. Yeah, it does. It does. It feels like it's in a like it feels like it's in a good place. The numbers do seem skewed heavy towards towards one hero. Traditionally, it would result in a ban. But uh we'll 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 see. LSS has done a, a good job of taking cards out and putting cards in that need to be whether we thought so or not uh ends up usually being the correct move in the end so i trust i trust their judgment on me fresh thank you Patrick. for coming coming on no, to the pot no we problem. appreciate you absolutely thank yes, you for thank having you so me. much love chatting with this, you guys always yeah this is this is has been a pleasure you are now you are now the second two-timer to come on Ooh. to the podcast the jacket will out. always be Number one, but you are number number two of the two timers. <laughs> yeah, right, right. two timer, all right. No, <laughs> yeah. no I'm kidding. He's um, a good dude. Um, yeah. All right, uh, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna hop off because I'm gonna start. Um, I don't want to keep Gary up too late, but thank you guys for having absolutely. me. Sure, sure. Um, do you want Do you want to plug your stuff real quick? Oh yeah, yeah, I can do that right now, if you want. Yeah, go, go, go. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, thank you guys for having me. I really appreciate it. You guys are some of my best friends in this game. And uh, I always love chatting with you. And I love what you're doing over here. And <clears throat> you can find me on Twitter at FreshBudsPod. You can uh, check out the Buds Discord, which is in my link tree, which is also um, uh, in my bio on, on Twitter. And uh, my podcast is Fresh and Buds kind of guest focused, you know, chat some strategy, chat some meta, chat some silliness. And then uh the the live podcast, which also the the video of lives on YouTube, you know, it is it can live both live and not live, is the Bud Rush Bellow. That's on my YouTube. You can just search Fresh and Buds or the Bud Rush Bellow. Hopefully it comes up. And yeah, um uh, yeah and uh support these fine folks here and and um you know they're they're doing great work. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Tommy Fresh, for, for coming on. And now we're going to get on to, uh, we're going to meet our next guest. Our next guest is just like our country. He's young, scrappy, and hungry. He certainly did not throw away his shot. 
Michael Hamilton became the 2022 U.S. National Champion on Sunday, fighting off a very game Dan Rutkowski in the finals, piloting his innovative Icelander deck. Now all eyes will be on him as we set for a collision course with the likes of Pablo Pintor and others at the Flesh and Blood World Championships to determine who the best player in the world is. Congratulations on another big win, Michael, and welcome to the combat chain. We're excited to have you. Thank you. Happy to be here. Um, it was a uh, it was a pretty crazy weekend, uh, all things considered. Uh, now that you've had a couple of days to let this all sink in, where does where does the uh, U.S. Nats rank for you in terms of your career victories, and how are you feeling? Well, I'm feeling very good and very proud, I guess. Um, I think as far as where it ranks, I think nationals, it definitely feels more significant than winning a calling, especially the U.S. nationals with it being larger than most of the callings here, at least by a little bit. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, I I feel, I think, I think I would rank it higher than those, I guess. Excellent. Fair enough. Fair enough. And, uh, um, uh, so you've played, uh, you've played Oldham. Uh, on one calling you played a control starvo in another calling and now you're on icelander so you you've been piloting these kind of slower decks uh it seems like the whole time and now in a generally slowed down meta uh some of these games have really kind of drawn out and it seems like a real grind so you obviously won but how how do you feel these drawn out matches uh uh take a do they take a toll on you or do you use that kind of length to your advantage so I do think they take a toll on me. I think playing long rounds, a bunch of rounds in a row, it's hard to always play your best when that's happening. I think that I personally just am very, I have a very strong preference towards these slower decks because I feel like you get more decisions over the course of a game because the games are longer and I really enjoy that. Mm-hmm. So I've always kind of played these slower decks because of that. And so I'm kind of used to having these long tournaments where you play seven plus long rounds in a day. So I don't think it, okay. I don't want to say it doesn't affect me, but it's something that I've gotten used to from doing it so often. It's kind of like trading, I guess. Yeah. It's kind of, it's kind of like a, a cold weather football teams, right? They, they, they work better in the cold. Uh, three yards in a pile of dust uh, kind of situation. Now, do you you, you talk about those decision points uh, with those decks? Do you have those kind of like ingrained in you at this point? Like, if you if you pick up an Oldham deck, how much of that is muscle memory, really, and just like recognizing that this is the sequence that needs to be played, and how much of that is actually having to kind of think on your feet at the any given moment. I would say there's a lot of decisions that I can make pretty quickly because um, the combination of familiarity with both my deck and my opponent's deck means that I know like how cards should line up and what's important to block and when you should be taking damage to present something else back and that kind of thing. But I do think a lot during games, especially when they're, especially the untimed rounds, I think in the Icelander mirror, I was both somewhat inexperienced in that matchup and I spent, a ton of time thinking about a few plays in that matchup, but sure, and that and that and that one in particular, right, the semifinals that went uh, that went clear over an hour uh, of of actual gameplay. That's that's a it's a long time to play play the game. Um, your Icelander deck had an innovation that not a lot of people saw coming. You explained in your post-match interview that cards like Scar for Scar and Findel's Fighting Spirit were already ranked highly for you in Limited, and so you wanted to try it out and construct it. Uh, expanding on the Fighting Spirit concept, you found Wounded Bull. Uh, the community is still talking about how wild it is that you made a deck like this, and we want to know all about it. Uh, tell me about the environment that you tested in and what aspect of that testing affords you the flexibility to really try something so different like this. So, leading into Pro Tour 2, me and Roger were looking for a testing team, and eventually we joined the Wolf Pack. And everyone there has been great, and we've had lists that I feel comfortable with the people on my team. If this Icelander list didn't work out, I could fall back to one of their old time lists or one of their regu- more, more traditional Icelander lists and feel like 
confident that I had a solid list going into the tournament. So having that kind of in my pocket, I guess, lets me have more time to explore wilder concepts. Mm -hmm. And I was a pretty big believer in these attack actions just because they're so efficient and so on rate. And then in classic constructed, a lot of the time you need to disrupt the aggressive decks in order to not get ran over, especially on these slower decks. But because of because of Icelander's ability to disrupt them from Arsenal on her own turn, you don't really need your attacks to be disrupting them. Like how an old Heim needs to play like Spinal Crush and Pummels and Command and Conquerors to make mm-hmm. sure he doesn't get ran over by the aggro decks. Well, Icelander doesn't need those threatening things on her attacks. So in theory, this was just like an idea that I really wanted to try out, just playing as efficient of attacks as possible. And because I had my teammates in the wolf pack, I felt very comfortable that if this idea didn't work out, if just relying on this disruption from Arsenal wasn't good enough, that I could just switch back to a more traditional list that other people had been working on. Now, uh, you bring up the wolf pack. Uh, is, is the wolf pack relationship something a bit more long term? Is there anything uh, in your past testing that may have driven you to the wolf pack? <laughs> yeah, so one of the. I don't, want, I don't want to say mottos, but one of the things that uh, Zach and some of the guys say is that the wolf pack is for life. And everyone there, it feels like, it almost feels like a family. And I really like that. And I couldn't, I couldn't imagine like any long term drama or anything like going super badly because there's a lot of communication going on and people like trust each other and talk about basically everything whenever there's a problem we've talked about it and that has not been exactly what has happened when i've tried to work with other groups and it hasn't always been like expectations haven't always been communicated the same way that they are in the wolf pack and i feel like with this group i know what i'm getting into i know what the expectations are and it's and i know that my teammates also know what the expectations are and we have the same shared thoughts about how everything's going to work and i think that's very good to have a team of people working together when everyone knows how everything's going to work and shake out. Absolutely. Uh, I think that's something we're all striving for. Uh, uh, leading from uh, my last question here, uh, we, we bring up our first community set of questions. And uh, Justin Evans asks uh, a series of them. Uh, how long will you test a card in a deck before you decide that it's good or you drop it? He also follows up with how far out from an event do you log into a deck? And lastly, what is the best reaction that you had to wounded bull? <laughs> okay. So I'm going to start from the top. I'll get to the best reaction. Cause I had a, there was a pretty good one I had that I happy to share the story, but first, how long do I test the card in a deck? Um, usually I feel like I can get a good idea of how much I like a card or how good a card is within a few games of playing it. If it's in my hand and I keep blocking it or I keep being like, I wish this was anything else, then it's pretty easy to realize that it's not doing what you're trying to do. There are some cards that are like harder to know because a lot of times your blues, you're, it's harder to figure it out because their primary use is as resources. So it's harder to know if this is the correct blue that should be in your deck. It's pretty easy to tell when a blue is good if you're like man i I wish i had another blue so i could just play this blue but that doesn't happen that often Mm -hmm. um for for reds though if i keep drawing my hands and be like man i need just need to block with this then or i wish i could do i wish this was a different card it's pretty easy to rule them out and then once you're past that point where you're like okay i'm playing this card a lot it's very easy to just look at how it's impacting the game and basically it's value output it has so Mm-hmm. Wounded Bull and Fire and Dolls Fighting Spirit both let you play two cards. Two card eights is what I is what we call them because you pitch one card and you play the card, and the card is worth eight points of value between either attacking for eight in the case of Wounded Bull or attacking for seven and healing for one in the case of Fire and Dolls Fighting Spirit. We're, I, I do want to. We're, I'm gonna follow up with you on on that because we do have. I've got I got more questions, but yes, the best reaction to Wounded Bull. Okay, so the best reaction. I sat down against Cody Williams in round four of the tournament, which was the first round of Classic Instructed. And he's 
on old time, I'm on Iceland. We present our heroes. We shuffle up and we're, we're talking a little bit. Me and Cody, we've, we've played a few times. We're, I'd say we're at least acquaintances. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. he's like, man, I almost played Icelander at this. I've been working on this battle mage Icelander and I just couldn't get it to work. <laughs> I couldn't get there. And I was going to, and then I'm like, oh, that's really interesting. Like, were you playing like pummels and stuff? Because a lot of the quote battle mage Icelanders I'd heard of were like, playing a lot of two cost attacks and tunic pummeling those two cost attacks. Yeah. He's right, like, like frost fang pummel type stuff. Yeah. Frost fang command yeah. and conquer race face. Mm-hmm. And I think even icy encounters been in some of them, but yep. and he's like, no, I think, I think pummel is not good. That's not what I was working on. And then I'm like, Oh, that's, that's really interesting. And I, sh- and I shuffle up and then I'm like, turn two or something. I play a wounded bull and he's like, Oh, you're on that deck. <laughs> and he's like, we, we kind of talked some more. It's like, I was so close to playing that and I was going to play it. I was probably going to work on it more for worlds. And if you win the tournament with that deck, I'm going to be so salty or something. And it was just, <laughs> it was really funny. And I haven't talked to him since the events wrapped up, but hopefully, hopefully he's not too upset. It was, but that was, that was my favorite reaction. Just the fact that he had the same idea and he was working on it. And Yeah. Excellent, excellent. Uh, uh, Kromsler from the Discord does ask, uh, how do you approach deck building? I feel like that was uh, pretty, I think that kind of lumps in with what you were just saying. Um, There is a, there's a seemingly constant discussion around deck building when it comes to establishing the rate of cards you play in your deck. Are they good? Are they bad? Uh, There are a lot of people that would look at your deck on its face and say, no, these cards are bad because of reason X, Y, Z. Uh, Fablog, uh, also known as uh, Clark Jansen, asks, how do you evaluate card value? What is above and below rate? And if you could explain it as if you were talking to a brand new Fab player. Okay. So the way I look at the rate of a card is just how much value it gains you. And value is in terms of life points. It either saves you or inflicts to your opponent and or damage inflicts to your opponent. So if you look at like if you look at I'm trying to think what card I should use as, as an example. If you look at just Wounded Bull, for example, mm-hmm. <laughs> you can spend three resources and it attacks for seven. And if it you're lower than your opponent, then it attacks, it gets plus one attack. So it attacks for eight. So mm-hmm. Wounded Bull on rate, you're spending two cards for either seven or eight damage, which is what I would say is the rate of the card in basically its ideal circumstance of you just getting to attack with it. So that is a, it's getting basically, if you're taking two cards to play it, your blue that you're pitching and the card itself, you're getting roughly four points of value for each of your cards because it's attacking for eight and spending two cards. Um, what is above or below rates? So most cards, or a lot of the, a lot of cards block for three. And the fact that you ju- can just usually convert a lot of cards in your deck to three blocks and just save three life with them. I think that is what I consider like at rate or the rate yeah. that you're kind of expecting your card to get because it's very easy to fill your deck with cards that block three and most of the time you can just use them to block for three life. Mm-hmm. Um, the average the average constructed deck is intending to get more than three points of value from its average card because constructed decks are like kind of the you're getting the cream of the crop here you're getting to combine your cards in a way that they should be as powerful as possible so if it's above three damage per card i would consider it above rate but most constructed decks are made up of a lot of ways to get above rate damage and that's why they're constructed viable basically and then are there there any cards that perhaps aren't being played currently that you you would consider a above rate but just not necessarily like appropriate in the current meta that you're just kind of waiting to put into a deck and just obliterate people with well there's nothing that immediately springs to mind part of how i found wounded bull and vinyl's fighting spirit was i just realized that you're always lower than your opponent as i slander and that made Mm -hmm. these cards above rate because this this condition on them is just always turned on basically and there's a lot of other cards in the game that have these really weird conditions that were like, when would this come up? When would this matter? That potentially could make them also good enough to see play, but we just 
they just don't have the right tools to go with them that makes their conditions come up, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, you have a reputation as one of the best thinkers in the game. Uh, Matthew folks a couple weeks ago told us a story about prepping for uh, the calling Madrid, where you were playing with their Oldham player uh, testing for the mirror and blitz. Uh, it uh, he said that it might have been the first time that you had played the Oldham Muir at the time, yet you had clearly kept track of your opponent's pitch and knew when they drew the pulse uh, in their second cycle. Uh, Discord user Chaos, also known as Andy Pedleski, asks, uh, how did you get so good at pitch stacking and paying attention to your opponent's pitch stack in the process? So I think the biggest thing for this was learning and playing as Starvo. Um, when I was working on Starvo, it's basically very important to track what you pitched the previous turn. You need to know what elements you pitched because you want to set up your deck so you had the other elements next to them. So I was just like very strongly remembering the last like two turns of cards I had pitched to make sure I was like setting my elements up to be rainbow when I drew them on the second cycle. And that's really that just like practicing Starvo and learning that sequence just kind of stuck with me and i started remembering more and more cards that i had pitched just from like necessity i guess almost or like okay so i I remember these so i could make sure i was doing my starvo activations and i'd have to start remembering hey how close am i to getting to that turn where i can do the thing and i try to remember how many cards i'd pitched since then and i'd start counting my deck to see how far away i was and as you just start doing start just being more and more conscious of your pitch stack you just start remembering more and more about it and it's also something you have to be like practicing with intent it's like you have to be thinking about your pitch stack and at first i didn't remember very much and i got things wrong and i'd get to my pitch stack and it'd be i hit it a turn earlier or a turn later than i thought or i'd have some random blue in there that i forgot i had pitched Mm -hmm. and just like noticing those things and realizing that I had forgotten or messed it up. The next time I did it, I would just get better. And it's just something that you get better at over time. If you're consciously working on it. Is that, and you mentioned consciously working on that. Is that something perhaps like you do, do you work on that as, as a team, like something like situational awareness, like uh, a drilling uh, in a matter of speaking, uh, pitch stack sequencing and, and getting it back. Or is that, is that something you actively practice towards in your in your testing i wouldn't say we deliberately like we don't have like drills for it or something but when we're playing games that go to second cycle we definitely just like talk about what we're expecting to hit when we get to second cycle and we're talk about what we what we saw our opponents pitch and what if if there's like a combination of cards they pitch that we're worried about how how do we need to adjust how we're playing the game for it so like I guess just like that being part of the discussion of games since when you're playing matchups, you kind of know if they have a good chance of going to second cycle or not. And in matchups that have a reasonable chance of going to second cycle, you just need to be to, to describe what is happening in the game state to like maybe a spectator that jumps in 10 minutes into the game. You need to be aware of what was pitched to give them an accurate like idea of why you're making the plays you make. Mm-hmm. So excellent. Um, after you won the calling Indianapolis, Flake asked you if you were the best player in the world. And at the time, you said that you were the only two-time calling champion. Uh, there's a fun debate about who really is the best, and it seems like it's between uh, Pablo Pintor and yourself. So Bratwurst, also known as Tyler Broughton, asks, so who is it, you or Pablo? <laughs> well, first, I think Pablo is extremely good, and I have never gotten the chance to play against him so i haven't actually like seen it in person though i've watched a recent amount of his replays of course i think that the only way to really find out is wait for worlds and see how it goes uh, yes we're this I, it needs to happen lss if you're listening chris buley tell the guys over the tournament organization side opposite ends of the bracket so that they collide, right? Right in the end. 
This is audio only, but this is me putting the pyramid together <laughs> for the brackets for the finals. It so needs to happen that way. we're deliberately fabricate Jim to like pair Pablo yes. and uh-huh. Pablo together at mm-hmm. some point. Yes. That's yep. He's he's one seed east. He's one seed west. That, they meet. They meet in the Super Bowl. That doesn't That's how it's disrupt be. the 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 competitive integrity no. whatsoever. There there is only one competitive integrity. But speaking of world championships, they're a little over a month away. Do you feel any pressure now to become the world champion? <laughs> uh, like how would it, is it the goal? Is it on your dartboard? Is, is, is everything crossed off right now? You have calling champion crossed off. You have U.S. Nats champion crossed off. And now world champion in a series like surrounded by stars. Is that, is that what's there right now? So I would love to become the world champion. It is definitely, I'm going to work as hard as I can to make that happen. But in the end, it's a card game and I'm human and I have responsibilities outside of practicing for the flesh and blood tournament that I care a lot about and I'm going to try really hard at. And on top of that, there's a lot of variance in a card game. So Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I... Well, I'm very proud of my accomplishments and I feel great that I have won them. I can't say that I don't feel extremely fortunate as well. Like I definitely feel like luck has been on my side in quite a few spots. And I think that's, I think even if you're the best player in the room, which I'm not even saying that I am, you still are not even a favorite to win a tournament. You still have to have a lot of things go really well for you to win a 400 person tournament, you know? Mm Mm-hmm. There, there has been a lot of discussion about like who, right? We're talking about who is the best player in the world, and the same names start coming up because it does seem like that the same names are able to string these, uh, these victories over time together. There's, there's you, there's Pablo, there's uh, Colin Kaiser, who does not get enough, enough credit. The man's a two time calling champion now, he's a two time calling champion. You know, when the first calling was. 2019 in New Jersey before anyone was paying attention to it the man went and he won he's a two timer i had to look that up when he when i saw that he won and and found out that it was a two time champion but there is there's definitely and of course Tarek Patel uh and, and Matt Rogers etc cetera, etc cetera. what is it about you this group of players that you're in that they seem to be able to you speak on you speak on the variant to the game but there does seem to be an ability to almost mitigate that variance over a long period of time what 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 do you think it is that allows this elite section of player base to to continually rise to the top yeah so i guess i think the biggest thing is just actually how high the skill cap is in flesh and blood. If I look at basically any game I've played, I feel like I can usually pinpoint one or two small mistakes I've made. And the fact that I'm doing so well and I feel like I'm making mistakes in every game, it just means that like the skill ceiling of this game is so extremely high with how many decisions you're making every game. And even honestly, just every turn, you're making so many decisions about which cards to block, how to block, what to arsenal, what to play on your turn. And with how many how many micro decisions you make in every single game. I think that leaves a lot of room to mitigate the variance. And like if a player makes, if let's say a player makes 200 decisions in a game, if one player makes a hundred decisions correctly and the next player makes 110 correctly, they're only making like 5% more decisions better, but they're making, they're getting so many small edges from each of those decisions that they'll probably win most of the time. On top of that, I think, deck selection and having solid sideboard strategies goes a long way to improving your odds in a tournament. I think that a lot of the tournaments, well, I guess all all the tournaments that I have done well at, I feel like very happy about the decks that I brought. And I felt like I got at least some percentage points because my opponents didn't exactly know what I was doing going into the rounds and didn't know the optimal strategies against me. Whereas I had for the most part had reasonable amounts of practice against my opponents. And that is another way that like, you get a pretty big edge in games. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I like that. That's a, that's anything about that. The, the actual amount of decision points and then the correct amount of decision points versus your opponent. That is, uh, uh, this is why you get, you're on another level, Michael. I, I don't know how you do it. Um, 
So speaking on the world championships, uh, there's been a little controversy on the format of the world championships itself. How do you feel about the the mix of formats and the placement of them in the tournament structure itself? So I'm not going to say that I love Blitz or I'm super excited to be playing Blitz, but I'm also like they're having a huge tournament. It's got like $300,000 of prizes and it's a game that we all love and I'm not going to publicly complain about <laughs> what the format is. I do think if they are going to put Blitz in, I think the place that they put Blitz where it's at the final rounds is actually the best place to put it because with Blitz at the end, you're going to be playing against mostly players that have similar records to you or the same record as you after playing 11 rounds. So while Blitz may be higher variance in the other formats, the players you're playing against, your the variance even in a lower variance format that might be deciding the matches because if two top players are playing a game of flesh and blood, like it's like, if they both play perfectly, who's going to win? It's going to change from game mm-hmm. to game if they both play mm-hmm. perfectly. And mm-hmm. that happens even in classic instructed where the same player doesn't win every time when they play the same matchup over and over again. And then on top of that, the way tiebreakers work in flesh and blood your earlier rounds matter the most. It matters what your basically your most the most important rounds for tiebreakers are the first rounds. The sooner you pick up your losses, the worse your tiebreakers are. So yeah. having blitz at the end, a lot of the time your last round of the tournament, it doesn't actually matter whether you win or lose your last round going for whether you make top cut or not. And because of that, I think it's just like the best place to put Blitz is at the end of the tournament before top eight. And then they made top eight class constructed again, which is also definitely great. I'm glad Blitz isn't the top eight. (laughs) I was kind of, I was rooting for welcome deck top eight. That's what I was really (laughs) rooting for. The, the purest form, right. Of flesh and blood at that point. Uh, Coming out of the U S nets, what are your thoughts on, on the meta as it stands? Is it, uh, uh, I keep looking at the winning Nationals metagame uh, and seeing that Oldham, over the over the last two weeks, Oldham has 38.4% of, of the share of wins uh, uh, across the board. And then it goes down, like, it has 38.4% to Oldham and a 16 uh, in change percent to Briar, and then almost uniform across the board, I believe it's like 56 with all the other heroes. Are we in a healthy meta right now? I I think I might be a little bit biased because of how much I like Oldheim and Ice Heroes in general, but I personally think this is one of the best metas we've had in since I started playing, honestly. Mm-hmm. The Oldheim is currently considered the best deck, and I think like he will definitely be good and prevalent at Worlds and and he is very powerful. But I don't think that he's in a spot where you can't beat him. And with how many decks are rising up to combat Oldheim, the Icelanders, the Dromais, the honestly, even the other Oldheims that they have to play the mirror, it's hard for Oldheim to build his build it's hard to build an Oldheim deck in a way that is favored into these other slower decks, but also still beats up the aggro decks like Phi, Briar, and Viscerai. We saw Phi have a lot of success in US Nationals because these old times were changing their lists to be better against Dromais and Icelanders in the mirror, and suddenly their Phi matchup's not looking so great anymore. And I think that well, old time is very powerful, and he can, for the most part, have a pretty reasonable matchup into whatever deck he wants, outside of maybe the controlling dash decks. But <laughs> yeah, yeah <laughs> I've, heard, I've heard some nightmare stories about those those control dash lists. Yeah, there, there is a, I, th- I think the metagame is very healthy and I don't think Oldheim is the worst boogeyman that a format could have, like compared to Starvo or Chains dominance or even old lightning briar. I think Oldheim is a much better best deck for the format's health. Now you, you brought on this, the, the innovation for Icelander is, is now the time for players to be putting on their their brewer hats and try to build something something different for for the meta? Is there 
just is there something that is yet to be unlocked that's that's out there uh just ready to be built and and put together what what are your what are your thoughts on on brewing and innovation as a whole when it comes to especially coming into worlds yeah so i think in general since i think part of it's due to the lack of like an online um tournament series where decks are shared and quickly innovated on Mm -hmm. i think that the metagame in flesh and blood is honestly reasonably on it on unexplored or underexplored and i think that shows just like the decks that did well at u.s nationals and honestly some other tournaments as well were pretty un unheard of almost like people didn't really know that you could put a bunch of attack actions in isolator people didn't really know you could play like hardcore fatigue dash and have a lot of success and mm-hmm. the phylus were back on steering ember blade when yeah, there was a lot of talk about Emberblade Phi being dead, and the only way to play Phi is Kadashi Phi with mask momentum and stuff. And that's Shocked not what me. we saw at all in top eight. So <laughs> I think there's a lot of room for innovation still, and people are still just figuring out what the best and most powerful ways to do everything is right now. Is there is there any hero that's either do you think is maybe underrated at, at the moment that is just like on the precipice of? Of A to S tier. It's really hard to say. I think there's a lot of heroes that could be if certain things line up correctly in the metagame. Like, I guess jumping back, I think this control dash that Jacob Bob played, I think it was very good. And I think if the field is 30% old time, then that's probably the best deck to be on. As long as your bad matchups aren't horrible, you can just beat up the old times and have pretty solid matchups into Icelander, Dromai, and the Rune Blades as well. Oh. But I wouldn't shout out any specific deck as like this is the deck that you should work on for worlds. I think there's room for the brutes. I think the warriors aren't necessarily as bad as people think they are. They've occasionally had some results, and I think they're also reasonably underexplored. And Lexi's also a hero that hasn't really shown i guess like she's had some very good results and then she falls off the falls off a cliff basically and then we're like where'd lexi go but the some of her cards are extremely powerful and i think that's true about most heroes they all have really powerful things that they can do and it's just about figuring out how to maximize those things and figure out their matchups and if the meta is in a good spot for them then yeah let's pivot off your competitive player uh, hat here for a second and get onto your content creator hat. You are on the Combat Chain podcast right now, but you have entered the fray with the Manor Cast. Am I saying that correctly? Yep. Uh, mm-hmm. Tell me, uh, you're 18 episodes in. Uh, tell me about your experience so far as a caster yourself. Yeah. So me and Roger started making the Manor Cast because we. We just spent a lot of time talking about Flesh and Blood. He's my best friend. We, he got me into Flesh and Blood. We basically played the whole time together. And we spent so much time talking about Flesh and Blood. We're like, what if we, what if we record some of this? What if we start posting it on the air and see what people think? And reception was, we tried it. It was a lot more work to edit a podcast than I really expected it to be. But reception he, was... He knows. He knows. <laughs> I do all the editing, so I feel that... <laughs> Yeah, but reception was very good and people were appreciative. And I think this last weekend was the moment that I'm like, yeah, I could see doing this long term because both me and Roger had so many people approach us and be like, hey, I love your podcast. I really like this about it. You do this and it makes me laugh or whatever. And I'm like, that's that's really cool. And it makes I feel really appreciated for putting it out there. And it's very motivating to keep doing it and work on improving it. And yeah. You have any specific uh, goals, plans, uh, et cetera, for the for the podcast heading into the end of 2022 and out to 2023 here? Honestly, when we started doing it, we didn't really have any expectations about what it would turn into, what it would be. We just kind of were like, let's let's start recording our, ourselves talking about flesh and blood and see what happens. And I just want to keep working on it and keep 
doing it. I don't have any solid goals other than keep going and keep making good content, I guess. Feel that. Any plans on uh, anything toward like gameplay, deck tech, like video content for YouTube? Yeah, we were talking about making an Icelander deck tech about the deck that we, well, we both had Icelander decks. He got top four in the calling with his own take on Icelander with slightly less attacks than me. And we talked about making deck techs for our Icelander decks and Honestly, we, we really like talking about the game and talking to each other about the game. And that kind of content's not exactly something that I think we really feel super motivated to make, if that makes sense. So mm -hmm. for now, I think we're just going to keep sticking to what we're doing. And yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Um, a little off the script, uh, started to ask our guests this, though. Is there... Uh, what is one thing that someone that our audience might not know about you that you would you would like them to know? Oh no, I wasn't ready for this one. <laughs> no, that is right. Yeah, it's, uh, off the cuff. It can be any. It, give me your favorite food, as another hobby. What do you What do you like to do outside of Flesh and Blood? So very recently, I was introduced to this game called Blood on the Clock Tower. And what is, I'm sorry, what is it called? It's called Blood on the Clock Tower. Ooh, mm. okay, all right. And, cool. Leading right up before nationals, I had my birthday and I had like a bunch of people come over for a few days. And we basically, I was like, we're going to spend a couple hours playing this blood on the clock tower game. And it ended up taking up like a solid third of those three days. We just spent playing blood on the clock tower. And what it is, is it's this big uh, social deception game, similar to like mafia or werewolf, if you're familiar with those. But the idea is there's two teams, everyone gets a role and your role is you're either a good person as village aligned and you work with the village to find the evil people or you're one of the evil people and you try to blend in with the good guys and the evil people each night they pick someone and basically execute them or kill them and eventually if the good doesn't figure out who the evil people are the evil people will kill everybody and win and it's it gets people like talking to each other and interacting in really unique ways and in a weird way like it kind of you would think that like since you're lying to each other, you're like, yeah, I'm a good person when you're evil. It would like make people not trust each other. But I think that the bonds you have when you have two good people working together and they've realized that they're both good or they confirm it throughout the game somehow, they end up getting really close. And I really like seeing people make those kind of connections. So that's, uh, I basically have been moderating these games and it's one of my favorite hobbies, I guess, outside of, the competitive flesh and blood and other competitive games I play. All right. Uh, this is the time where uh, the floor is yours to plug anything and everything that you would like. So go right ahead. Well, I already kind of did a big uh, call out earlier in the episode, but check us out on the manor podcast. Me and Roger talking about flesh and blood, talking about strategy decks, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then where can we find you? Uh, oh, we're on YouTube, Spotify, I guess YouTube, Spotify, and basically most podcast apps. Maybe not all. If we're missing any, you can let me know and we'll try to get it added to that. But yeah, you can find us just about anywhere you can listen to podcasts at. You have, do you have a Twitter handle for yourself or the podcast? Uh, I have a Twitter. The podcast doesn't. My Twitter is at Hades Blade. Hades like the Greek god and blade like a sword. And yeah, you can find me there. I don't tweet too often, but the flesh and, flesh and blood community on Twitter is very positive. And every now and then I'll chime into some discussions. That is absolutely true. Love, love the flesh and blood Twitter community. Michael Hamilton, thank you for coming on. Uh, we're going to plug our stuff now. Uh, you can find us on YouTube at the combat chain. Uh, if you type in the combat chain podcast, you can find us there on Twitter. You can find us at the combat chain. You can find myself at Pat smash good, and you can find Adam at FOM Tulare TCG. Uh, if you want to support us, uh, please check out the link below for our Patreon. Uh, any amount helps us uh, keeps the lights on and the editing software up and running. Uh, it all counts. So uh, by all means, uh, we announced earlier, Maybe perhaps right now, depends on how the editing goes. The winner of the Celestial Cataclysm playmat that we gave away for reaching uh, and surpassing 300 subscribers. Again, congratulations, Derek Jones. 
Find us so that we can give it to you. If you don't find us, we're going to give it to somebody else. So you have uh, you have the clock starts right now. Whenever this is released, this, indis- that's when the clock we're giving starts. you an indiscriminate amount of time. We don't know how long we are. We, we are. We are. But, but the clock is ticking. It is ticking. Get in touch with us. And mainly because there's no messaging software or feature on YouTube. So we can't message. Yes, you. there is. There's not. There's <laughs> not. As practic- it turns out YouTube giveaways are not as practical as one might expect. We asked everyone to who wanted in to make sure that their profiles were public so we could pick a name, like get a name out of there. Not everyone did. So we we picked who we could uh, from from the list. And that's the best the best we can do. And uh, that's, you know, that's all anyone can really ask. All right. Am I missing anything else? No, I think that's everything. Excellent. All right. We got there. All right. Michael, every week uh, our guest helps us out with this, so I I encourage you to participate. I'm going to say until next week, and in unison, we're all going to say we're closing the combat chain, and it's beautiful, and in fact... Uh, Tommy Fresh is going to come in right next to me right here, and he's going to join in as well, aren't you, Tommy? Oh, I am. I am. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Michael Hamilton, Tommy Fresh, thank you again for coming on to the podcast this week, and I think that's going to do it for us. So, until next week, we're, we're closing, closing the combat, combat chain. chain. Boom. Nailed it. U.S. champ, Mike Hamilton. Thank you very much.